this is Matt Roscoe from the University of Montana and this is a talk on new methods for factoring quadratics um, and let's get started just a quick hello uh, for facial recognition thanks for taking interest in my topic and this is me and let's get to it so I want to give you an opening challenge talk a little bit about thinking about quadratics a short word about the AC method then introduce the two techniques and conclude so here's your opening challenge. Let's go ahead and factor each of these four quadratics. Let's take five minutes to go ahead and do that. I'll go ahead and start a timer. When the five minutes are up, we'll continue.
Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move on. We'll use uh, these quadratics in some of the examples throughout the presentation, so maybe keep your work handy. So let's think about quadratics first. How would you order these quadratics developmentally from easiest to hardest from a standpoint of teaching your students how to factor them? Let's just take maybe 10 seconds for you to put a 1, 2, 3, or 4 next to these in terms of easiest being a 1 and hardest being a 4. 10 seconds. Okay, well, uh, I'm curious if this would be your ordering. Um, if we were in a room together, I'd have you share with your neighbor and discuss your rationale. But uh, this is the ordering I came up with, and I, you know, I really kind of thought deeply about all four of these polynomials. And let me tell you why I chose this ordering. Um, let's take it, an example um, and and talk about how we could sort of rank these. Um, so let's take an example of 5x squared plus 27x minus 18. So uh, um, what we're trying to do is write that in the form ax plus b times cx plus d. And we know that the, the a and the c have to be factors of 5. And we know that the b and the d have to be factors of negative 18. And of course, the cross product, the adx and the bcx, have to add together to make 27x. So the way I sort of think of ranking these is I first think about, well, what would it take to exhaust all possible um, um, placements of factors of 5 and negative 18 if I was to just simply exhaust all the possibilities? So I think of 5x as having just a single factor pair, 1 and 5. I'm assuming that we're, we're factoring into holes, uh, whole numbers, I should say integers. But the 1 and the 5 can go in one of two locations, either in the A position or the C position or vice versa. So one factor, two locations. Uh, if we take a look at the negative 18, then there are three factor pairs. There's 1 and 18, 2 and 9, 3 and 6. And each of those pairs has two different uh, um, locations where they could be assigned, either for the B or for the D. Um, but there's also these two sign assignments, right? For each factor pair, one could be positive and ne the other negative or vice versa. So if we kind of think of it as a difficulty assignment, I'm just making this up, um, but we could think of it as, well, there are one choice, two choices, three choices, two choices, and two choices. So multiplying that all together means that there are 24 potential choices that you have to make, or I guess solutions that you would have to analyze if <clears throat> you were to find the correct factorization via exhaustion, meaning by listing all the potential, uh, um, I guess, factorizations and then checking the cross product. So this one would have a difficulty assignment of 24. If you carry out that same, um, that same technique on the other four quad three quadratics that are provided, uh, the easiest one by far uh, in terms of difficulty assignment is this one, 30. It only has four factor pairs. Um, and since it's positive, there's no you know, switching of signs. Or, or so just the four factor pairs is all you have to know. Uh, to be able to, I guess, check that via exhaustion. Um, the, um, the next most difficult one would be this one. Of course, the difficulty assignment goes up quite a bit. Um, there are uh, 12, 84 has 12 factors, which means it has six factor pairs. But since it's negative, there are two assignments um, for the positive and the negative. So 6 times 2, or 12, would be the number of potential factorizations you'd have to check if you did this by exhaustion. Uh, difficulty goes up quite a bit and doubles here um, once the leading coefficient is 5 and the trailing coefficient negative 18. Um, and uh, also much more difficult than would be this last one. Of course, the difference here is you know not much of an increase in the 18 to negative 24, but a huge increase in difficulty associated with the 12 versus the 5. The reason being that the 12, again, has quite a few factor pairs. Uh, that have to be analyzed in, in two different locations for them. So you have quite a few more choices. In fact, you would have to write up 96 different potential, um, I guess, factorizations uh, if you were to just simply check cross products um, uh, and, and defeat this by exhaustion. So I think it's kind of interesting, a three-fold difficulty, uh, raise in difficulty going from the first to the second, double the difficulty going from the second to the third, triple the difficulty uh, roughly, no, well, no, sorry, four times the difficulty going from the third to the fourth. One observation I was thinking about when I did this is that, you know, there are only four two-digit numbers that have 12 factors. 
So 84 is one of those. It's the second most difficult one in our list. And no other two-digit num number has more factors than 12. Um, so we commonly ask students to factor quadratics of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. So when we restrict that to a equals 1 and c as a two-digit number, then the difficulty assignment is never higher than 12, meaning that all you ha the most you're going to have is six factor pairs. Um, and if it's negative, two places to assign them. I thought that was kind of interesting. So in other words, any factoring problem that has a two-digit uh, y-intercept or trailing coefficient is it, never going to rise to much of a, you know, of a high level of difficulty when we compare them to leading coefficients not equal to 1. So what about the procedures you teach for factoring quadratics? Are they similar or different? Do they have certain categories? You know, how would you sort of categorize these in terms of your teaching? I think most of you would probably say there are two common classifications for teaching here. You know, there, there is these quadratics where the leading coefficient is 1, much easier to factor, and quadratics where the leading coefficient is not equal to 1, much more difficult to factor. Um, and it's the second category that the talk is going to concentrate on today. What do you do with the difficult quadratics uh, and how do you teach them? So one word about the AC method. You may or may not know this method, but if you do, I'm introducing it to you. Um, if you don't, I should say, I'm introducing it to you here. Uh, so when we ask students to factor quadratics of form AX squared plus BX plus C, where A is not equal to 1, sometimes we teach the student to find the number AC. This is why it's called the AC method. So in other words, take the leading coefficient and the trailing coefficient and multiply them together. And we find that product, uh, excuse me, and, and then we factor that product, we factor AC, to find one of its two, uh, find two factors, or a product equaling AC, whose sum equals B. And then we rewrite BX using this sum, um, and then that allows us to factor the quadratic by parts. Let me show you an example if you've never seen this. So if we take 5x squared plus 27x minus 18, multiply 5 times 18, so that's a times c, we get negative 90. And then we, we factor negative 90, and notice that negative 3 times 30 is the right factor to use because, of course, those two numbers add to 27. So we rewrite the middle term, the 27x, with these two numbers, 30x minus 3x. And when you do that, almost by magic, you can factor out something out of these first two terms, 5x, and these second two terms, negative 3, and it has to be the greatest common factor of those two pairs of terms. And then noticing that you have two terms separated by a minus sign that have a common factor of x plus 6, the x plus 6 can come out in front, that leaves a 5x minus 3 on the tail. So that's the AC method. Multiply a times c, rewrite the middle coefficient with the right uh, factor pair, and factor by parts. But why does this work? Well, here's why it works, and it's not an easy explanation. If I take these two products, px plus q, rx plus s, and multiply them together, I get this thing, prx squared, psx, qrx, and qs. Usually, <coughs> we, group, we group these two um, like terms in the middle, factoring the x out. And then we calculate these numbers, right? We don't leave them as, as products. So we calculate pr and call it a. PS plus QR, call it B, QS, and call it C. This is the thing that we're typically given to factor. So what happens if we use the AC method? So the AC method says take A and multiply by C. Well, what is A times C? Well, it's nothing more than PR times QS. And so we get PRQS. So if we factor AC so that it will sum to B, what we are doing is really rewriting B as PS and QR, right? So we're looking for factors of AC that sum to B. Well, obviously, PS is in there and Q, uh, QR is in there. So those are two factors of AC. And if we can find those two factors, we can use that and recreate what we call the loss sum, or I'm calling the loss sum, which paves the way for factoring by parts. In other words, we recreate this piece in the middle, and that allows us to factor this four-term polynomial by parts. In the first half, we're going to factor out the px, and the second two terms, the q, which is, of course, just reversing the double distribution we did with px and q at the front. So let's stand back and look at that and ask ourselves, could we ever explain this to an Algebra 1 student? 
I really don't think so. I think it's apparent that understanding the rationale for this method requires advanced familiarity with algebra, which most students in Algebra 1 do not possess. So maybe we shouldn't teach the technique as it promotes rules without reasons in math. I think that's really the underlying cause of why so many of our students don't like math. It's, they don't understand why it works sometimes. So what do we do? Um, well, it turns out that some new techniques have arrived. So maybe we could use some new techniques or consider them at least. Let's take a look at those today. So the first one comes from 2018. Adam Clinch, a teacher at um, Helena Capital, uh, successfully published his first technique in the Mathematics Teacher Magazine. Here's the cover page for his article. I'll include the article in the web resources for this talk. I highly suggest you read it. I think it's a great article. Plus, I think it really shines uh, a light on, on you know, a, a talented math teacher in Helena who took the initiative to share his invented strategy with the rest of the world. Um, that he's a sole author on a, te uh, excuse me, a, a, an article in the Mathematics Teacher, you know, a national journal uh, published by the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics is, is really uh, an indication of, I guess, a, a huge accompl accomplishment, and I really want to, uh, I guess, acknowledge that here um, and say congratulations to Adam. If you're watching or if you know him, make sure and, and share that with him. So let's take a look um, at his technique. I think the easiest way to do this is just to show you an example. Um, so let's do the example on 5x squared plus 27x minus 18. I'm going to switch over to my Elmo cam. And let's see, how am I doing? Yeah, it looks good. So how does Adam's technique work here? Let's check. 5x squared plus 27x minus 18. Okay, well, the first step in Adam's technique is just to take um, the polynomial we're given and to convert it into a polynomial with leading co coefficient of 1 by factoring out the 5. If we do that, we get an x squared for the first term plus 27 fifths x minus 18 fifths. And I know what you're thinking right now is, oh, if they struggle with algebra, they, they, they're going to struggle with fractions as well. But there really isn't as much fraction work here as, as you think. Um, and the next step, what Adam says is, well, look, what we know about this polynomial is we multiplied two fractions to get this one. We added two fractions to get this one. If we added two fractions to get this one, then those two fractions must have a common denominator of 5. If we multiply two fractions to get this one, when the common denominator was 5, their denominator should have been 25, and we must have lost a 5 somehow in rewriting it in lower terms. So let's recreate the right denominator for multiplication. So what he does is he says, let's take x squared plus 27 over 5x, and rewrite this one as 18 over 5 times 5 over 5, which of course in the next step gives us this, x squared plus 27 over 5x minus 18 times 5 is going to be 90, and 5 times 5 is going to be 25. And what Adam says here is, well, now we know that the two denominators in both terms are 5s. Um, we have something of the form x and x here, a plus or minus, so I'm not going to write anything in there. It's certainly a fraction here over 5, and certainly a fraction here over 5 is what we'd expect, because multiplying this by this gives 25, and adding something that's denominator 5 to something with denominator 5 will give something with denominator 5. So in effect, what we've done is create a polynomial now where we only have to concentrate on the numerators. So all we're looking for is two numbers that multiply to negative 90 and add to 27. 1 and 90 doesn't work. It's either 89 or 91. 2 and uh, 45 doesn't work. It's either 47 or 43. But 3 and 30 does work, of course, um, to get 27. What do we want? We want um, a positive 30 and negative 3. So it'll be negative 3 here and a positive 30 here. And now we could do a little s uh, uh, rewrite this fraction in lower terms if we want to. 5 times x minus 3 fifths times x plus 6. And this is where we could certainly leave it. It's certainly in factored form. 
Moreover, it's in the x-intercept form. We know these are the two intercepts, or the zeros of the polynomial, if we were to graph this uh, as a function of y. So really, this is the most useful form of the polynomial in terms of interpreting its graph. Um, but of course, the book solution would probably distribute the 5 across the first term, call it 5x minus 3, uh, x plus 6. This is also easier to check. Of course, um, five times 5x five times x gives us its first term. Negative 3 times 6 gives us our last term. And the cross product of 30 minus 3x gives us our middle term. So certainly, this is uh, the solution that we're after. One thing I should highlight here is that, interestingly enough, um, these two terms get multiplied together and used there are, of course, the term that we think of as being AC. When we took a look at our AC example, 5 times negative 18 is negative 90. So in effect, what's going on is, is we're finding a reason to use AC uh, in, in our solution that may uh, make better sense to some of our students because, of course, they know how to factor polynomials like this. The only really thing that we have to do to help them is to worry about reasoning about these denominators, I think. Because once we get to here, then the problem becomes as easy as x squared plus 27x minus 90. Well, I'm curious what you think. I wish I could talk to you directly, but maybe we could, uh, in the Q&A session, um, get your, um, get your, uh, I guess your reflections. So I'll just highlight that. I'll make a copy of this and, and include it in the uploads for the, uh, for the talk. Um, so let's try it again on the harder of the two polyn or of the two difficult polynomials that we've been given examples of. Um, instead of, in the interest of time, instead of working the whole example through again, I think what I'll do is just show you a worked solution. So how would this look? So again, we'd start with the polynomial. We would factor out the 12 to make this uh, leading coefficient 1. We get some nasty fractions, 23 12s, 24 12s. Of course, this is a difficult polynomial factor. We should probably expect some complexity. Um, we go ahead and adjust the denominator by multiplying by a, top and bottom here. So I get x squared minus 23 12s x minus 288 over 12 times 12, or 12 squared. So that means that 12 is my denominator here and here. And evaluating negative 288 for factors that sum to negative 23, uh, you have to make a fairly exhaustive list. It looks like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 different factor pairs until you get to the correct one, 9 and negative 32. Uh, but filling those in, you get this one. Um, and then uh, a few things that you could do. Uh, you could simplify 9 twelfths to 3 quarters, 32 twelfths to 8 thirds, and then think about 12. I mean, this would be a perfectly good answer. We're now in the, uh, in the I guess, factored for roots form. These are the two roots of the polynomial. Um, but if you wanted to check a book example, you're going to actually have to split the 12 up uh, into 3 times 4, multiply the 4 across this term and the 3 across this term to get let's say what we call a book example, or a book uh, um, factorization. So again, um, it is interesting that, that we again multi end up working with this number AC uh, in our example. That's your AC again. So it does seem that this particular, perhaps every factorization strategy for these types of polynomials employs somehow employs this AC uh, and trying to find factors of AC that add to a middle term, uh, the B term. Okay, so that in a nutshell is Adam's technique. Uh, let's talk about it a little bit more and then move on to technique number two. Um, there is, I did want to call your attention to in his, in his article, if you go and read it, he does have a nice table. This is just copied from his article that, that talks about um, you know, finding roots, a descri you know, concrete description, and um, you know, might be something that would be uh, worth reading and, and, and making sure you understand if you were ever to teach this. 
So Adam's article is really well worth reading, and I just encourage you to read it. He reported an increase in quiz scores uh, from one year to the next of 14 percentage points with small standard deviations, by the way, only two to three um, points standard deviations. So it seems like a significant increase. Uh, moreover, he argues that his new method is superior to other methods because it builds on prior knowledge. It's conceptually based. In other words, you can understand why it works uh, with the, I guess, with the understanding that Algebra 1 students have. And uh, it avoids case-by-case -case analysis. In other words, you don't have to exhaust all solutions. In fact, you have to exhaust quite uh, fewer. And we had to look at a total of, I guess, 7 times 2 if we think of the sign assignments, so something like 14 cases instead of 96. So let's talk about technique number two. Um, about a year after Adam's article came out, I received an email with an interesting attachment. I read the first paragraph, and this is what it said. The eight standards for mathematical practices described in the Common Core State Standards have opened up a great deal of discussion in K-12 mathematics. That's a good thing. Infusing school mathematics with an emphasis on what mathematicians mathematics professionals do and think holds a great deal of promise for bringing some coherence and texture to the zoo of special purpose methods and tools that clutter our curriculum state tests. Simply raising the idea that there is a practice of mathematics, just as there's a practice of medicine or teaching, and then detailing some facets of that practice is so very refreshing. So in short, uh, I was hooked. Uh, in the document, the author gives several examples of the mathematical practices in action. Uh, so he, he gives examples of mathematical practice 1, 3, and 7, I think. Um, after treating the dreaded word problem, which is his example of practice number 1, um, persevere in problem solving, the author examines factoring, which is his example of mathematical practice 3, which is looking for making use of structure, I think. Um, in this section, the author provides a technique that I'd never seen for factoring quadratics with leading coefficients not equal to 1. So let me show you his technique, again, using our old friend 5x squared plus 27x minus 18. All right. Maybe I'll make this full screen just to make it bigger. So we have 5x squared um, plus 27x minus 18. So what this uh, author does first is he says, you know, if I could make this a perfect square, then I could substitute it out um, as some other variable. So his, his technique is to transform this one into an easier one to solve and then transform that answer back um, to find a solution to this one. So his transformation will involve multiplying the whole thing by 5. So I'm using a, a forward arrow because it's certainly not equal. Or the implication, I guess. I don't even know what the right arrow here to do. It's really, it's a different problem, an easier problem. But here's the interesting part. He says, well, rewrite this as a 5 times 5 and x times x. So really, it's quantity 5x squared plus 27 times 5x, if I distribute the 5. And then if I multiply the 5 times the 18, I get negative 9. And here we can see we have a quadratic. Instead of in x, it's a quadratic in 5x. And so we should be able to substitute out. We can call z 5x and rewrite this thing. I should say let, let z be equal to 5x. Then we have what? Well, we have z squared plus 27z minus 90. Sure looks a lot easier to factor than that one. So I think this is a pretty engaging, um, yeah, I guess a convincing thing. You know, students will see this and say, oh yeah, I know how to do that. The only thing you have to do is teach them how to get there through this unique substitution. Let's see how it plays out. Um, of course, it's negative 90, so we're looking at 1, 90, 2, and 45 again. We'll end up with 3 and 30. Uh, we want a positive 27, so it's a negative 3. So this is z minus 3. This is z plus 30. But of course, this isn't the solution to that one. In fact, it's, it's not even the solution to this one, which is five times the solution to that one. So let's go ahead and, and figure out uh, what we should do next. I, I guess what we do next is we resubstitute or back substitute the 5x in for z. So we get 5x minus 3 and 5x plus 30. And 
Of course, this again is not the solution to that. This is the solution to the original one that we have up here, where <coughs> you know the two leading coefficients make 25 x squared. We want the one with 5 x squared, so we need to, to transform it back. We have to divide by 5, so to uh, get back to the original, divide by 5. And this is kind of interesting because it just so happens to be a factor of 5 in this term, so if I factor it out and get rid of it, um, so we would end up with what? 5x minus 3 times 5. Five, oh, sorry, not 5x, but just x plus 6, all divided by 5. These 5s will cancel. And we get, of course, just 5x minus 3 times x plus 6, uh, which, of course, is the solution that we've seen before. I think it's really interesting. We're doing it again. Does everybody notice that when I multiply the 5 times the negative 18, uh, we again get this AC term. This is my A, this is my C, so this guy is AC. And again, it just seems like any of these techniques is going to have to at some point confront this term AC and ask the question, how can I rewrite factors of AC as a cross product? Um, I don't know what you th think of that. It's interesting. It avoids Adam's, um, I guess, fractions, um, but it does involve a, a change of variables. Um, so subbing out and subbing back in. Um, I think it's an interesting technique. What about uh, applying this technique to the hard one? So again, in the interest of time, instead of um, actually constructing uh, the solution, let's go ahead and take a look at a work example. So here it is. Let's just see if we can kind of figure out what we did again. So we take this uh, polynomial and we transform it by multiplying by 12. If I multiply by 12, this one becomes the quantity 12x squared. This becomes 23 times 12x, and then 12 times 24 gives us 288, which of course is again our old friend AC, right? So we can see this is now a polynomial in 12x, so we can call z12x, and we get this polynomial. Notably more difficult to factor, we get a three-digit, um, I guess, third term, and it's pretty highly composite too, so that means it has lots of factors. But certainly the technique is unchanged. We come over, run through factors until we find one that works. 9 and negative 32 will work. So this one factors is z plus 9, z minus 32. But we're not after z, we're after x, so we substitute back in 12 and 12 here for, for z. And it turns out that both of these have factors that can be factored out. Um, this one, it looks like I can take a 4 out of. This one, I can take a 3 out of. So if I factor the 4 and the 3 out of each, I get a 12 as a leading coefficient, and I'm left with 4x plus 3, 3x minus 8. And to get back to the original, we'd of course, since we multiply by 12 here, we have to divide by 12. So the correct factorization of the original is 4x plus 3, 3x minus 8. Now, once again, we're confronting AC and asking, well, how do I rewrite AC so that its factors sum to our B term, which is preserved here? I don't know what you think. I'd be really curious to hear what you think of that, um, perhaps while we have some time in the question and answer. So in the article, which I'll attach again to the, um, the handouts for the talk, um, the author has a worked example for the quadratic 6x squared plus 11x minus 10. I analyzed this, and it has a difficulty assignment of 32. So it's somewhere in between our two um, worked examples, which have difficulty assignments of 24 and 96, respectively. Um, here's a picture of what it looked like. and. Uh, I think you'll recognize it. He, he says take the quadratic, multiply it by 6, then you get a quadratic in 6x, substitute in z for 6x, solve that quadratic, back substitute or, or um, uh, replace the z with a 6x, and then since we multiplied by 6 to get here, we got to divide by 6, 
we can get a 3 out of this first one, a 2 out of the second, so that gives us a 6. Getting rid of that 6 will give the original, the factorization of the original polynomial, 2x plus 5, 3x minus 2. The author says this, quote, the scaling method is a general purpose tool that has applications all over algebra and calculus. It amounts to a change of variable in order to hide complexity. Our use of this technique extends to a method that applies to polynomials of any degree and allows one to transform a polynomial in one variable into one that's monic. That's one of the steps that was used to derive Cardano's algorithm for cubics. So it's kind of a neat comment, I think. So this change of variables is a technique that's, that's fairly old and was actually used as one of the necessary steps to find a general um, formula for the solution to cubics, which was, of course, found by Cardano. Um, well, um, in conclusion, I just think that incorporating some new techniques for factoring quadratics with leading coefficients not equal to 1 has, has some potential to improve your mathematics teaching by building on students' previous knowledge and promoting reasoning while showcasing structure, all while nodding at important historical turning points in the study of algebra. So that's the end of my uh, talk. I want to say thank you. Um, this is my email. I'd really love to hear if any of these techniques get used in your classroom and to what degree of success you experience or failure. Uh, give it to me if it doesn't work too. I'd be really curious to know. Anyway, I thank you for attending and thank you for um, taking interest in the subject. And, Perhaps now we have time for some, some questions.